We're going to go ahead and start that so that we can record these and get these lessons up on the up on the internet as well and make any recordings that we need to for anyone. Uh, again, I'm going to try to, I, I'm trying to in some ways rush through some of, and I know it may not seem like it, but I'm trying to kind of rush through some of this background information before we get into the text, and I, I want us to get into the text as soon as possible, but I think it's important that we understand some of the background stuff before we get there because, as I've mentioned before, I think a lot of us carry a lot of baggage into the book of Revelation when we come to the text. The influence of the uh, premillennial uh, stuff is, is real prominent in, in most of us. In fact, you know, a couple of weeks ago I was talking about the, the passage that Jan Toomey brought up in, in Matthew 24 about maybe we want to be the left behind, uh, which is totally against what the book says. And it's interesting how many people have told me that they're not sure they can go with that because left behind must mean the, the bad people. And, and that whole understanding comes from that, uh, those, those books and that uh, interpretation of Revelation. And it just kind of shows how much we, even though we say we're not dispensational premillennialists, we've been influenced by that, by that language. And so there's just a lot of stuff that we carry with us when we go to the book of Revelation. Last week I was talking about the traditional view of Revelation being that there was this government-sanctioned, empire-wide persecution of the Christians. And let me just ask, how many of you in your studies of Revelation in the past have been told that that was the world that John was writing to, that all Christians were persecuted if they didn't fall down and worship the emperor. Uh, there was just this widespread persecution in the Roman Empire. How many of you have, have heard that before? That's kind of what you've been taught. Okay, a few of you. Uh, but as we were kind of getting into last week, there's no record of any Roman law outlawing Christianity at the time in the first century. Nor is there any evidence that Christians were bound by law to worship the image of the emperor. We're going to talk about some of that in a minute because we do have some writings that could suggest that, but I think if we look at those writings, we're going to see that that's not what they really do do say. There were two main persecutions that Christians tend to uh, say were going on at at the time that Revelation was written. One of them was during Nero's reign, the other one during Domitian's reign. And, uh, but we, what I want us to look at for just a minute this morning is the fact that those were not empire-wide, that the emperor issued a decree saying that Christianity was outlawed. Uh, Nero's persecution was really a direct response against the fire that burned most of Rome. And when that, and most of you have heard, you know, uh, Nero fiddled while Rome burned, or whatever the saying is. But, but when a big portion of Rome burned to the ground, a lot of people began to suspect that Nero himself had started the fire. And so Nero wanted a scapegoat. The Christians were a pretty, uh, the, they were held in pretty low regard at that time, and so they just seemed a, a good place to dump the blame for this and so they were blamed for burning Rome. They were persecuted, they were killed, they were treated terribly but we need to understand that it wasn't because they were Christians. They weren't killed and persecuted for their faith but it was for this crime they committed uh, by burning the city of Rome. Now that, so that persecution was only very localized for the Christians around Rome. It wasn't an a empire-wide persecution. And not only that, but it was also pretty short-lived because being the politician that he was, uh, Nero began to hear a lot of complaints from his citizens in Rome about his bad treatment of the Christians. And so once it, he started realizing that he was falling out of favor with the public because of his persecution of the Christians. He ended his persecution. And so it was done as a crime, 
punishment for a crime, not punishment for being Christians. And it was uh, also very localized and only for a very short period of time. The, the other one was during Domitian's reign, reign and uh, some Christians were probably put to death during his reign, but there isn't enough evidence that uh, those actions where the Christians were put to death was part of a systematic and widespread Roman manhunt against Christians. Eusebius, in his book, says that, and, and that's the primary source where we get our understanding of Domitian's reign and his persecution of the Christians, and he said that at one point he invited some of Jesus' family members to sit down and meet with him so he could understand what Christianity was about uh, more fully. And when he did that, he stopped his persecution of the Christians. And so again, this was a, a very brief period of time and a pretty localized place. Uh, so there's just not enough historic evidence to support this widespread persecution of Christians. In fact, uh, one of the things that we do have is a letter that was written uh, by Pliny, the governor of the Roman province of Bithynia, and he wrote to the emperor Trajan around 113 AD to seek guidance regarding trials of Christians. And and I'm going to read to you what what he wrote. And this is from that book, uh, A Slaughtered Lamb, by a guy named Stevenson. But but what uh, Pliny wrote was, I have never dealt with investigations about Christians, and therefore I don't know what is usually either punished or investigated or to what extent. So if he's a governor, what he's saying is, you know, I'm really not sure how we're supposed to deal with these Christians. So that that tells us that there wasn't an empire-wide standard of how to deal with Christians because he's asking, saying, I I don't know what I'm supposed to do with them. Uh, He said, I have hesitated no small amount about whether there should be some distinction in respect to age or whether young people, however young, should be considered not at all different from more mature people whether the name, meaning Christian itself, even if there is no criminal offense, should be punished, or whether only the criminal offenses associated with the name should be punished. And so he's saying that this tells us that being a Christian wasn't a crime, or or at least if it was, he didn't know that. He said, you know, I'm not sure, do do we punish them just because they wear the name Christians or just because there are crimes that are committed in that name. So there's just some confusion on his part about what to do with these Christians. He goes on and says, Soon, as usually happens, accusations become widespread and more incidences are reported. An anonymous pamphlet was published which contained the names of many people. And so it's this has come before him because people in the community are ratting out these Christians, which does tell us that the Christians were persecuted, but it's not an empire-wide crime to be a Christian. There's just something, you know, people uh, people are, are, t- are turning in their, their neighbors and, and people in the community for being Christians. And if we go back and read some of the early writings, we do understand that you know, there was a lot of persecution against Christians uh, because of their lifestyle. And we talked about this when we did our, our class on First Peter uh, a couple of years ago. You know, in, in that era, if you ran a store, you wanted to make sure that you had a, an idol up for all of the different gods that the communities worshipped. That way... Your community would be blessed, your store would be blessed, and it would show that you know you uh, fell in line with worshiping the, the deities that, that oversaw that, that uh, community. Uh, and I think one of the illustrations we used is you know if, if, uh, if the Chicago Bear was one of our deities, then anybody that showed up in our community with the, you know that cursed packer green on, uh, you would be excommunicated from the community because, after all, the Chicago Bear isn't going to bless Moline if we have people worshiping 
that Green Bay God. And, and that's kind of the way it was, but you know, we, we look at that as kind of a joke, but for them it was very serious. Whoever the deity was that oversaw that community, everybody better be worshiping him. Everybody better have an idol to him. Well, when someone became a Christian, they couldn't worship that deity anymore. And so it wasn't that it was a crime to be a Christian, but it's how dare you not honor the God of our community. And so this may have been some of what was going on and that was leading people to turn them in because uh, other people thought you know, it might bring uh, repercussions to their community because their gods weren't being worshipped. So anyway, an anonymous pamphlet was published which contained the names of many people. I thought, and this is uh, Pliny again writing to Trajan, he said, I thought that those who denied that they were or had been Christians should be dismissed if they prayed to our gods, repeating the words after me, and if they dedicated incense and wine to your image, which I ordered to be brought in for that purpose with the statues of the gods, and if, moreover, they curse Christ. It is said that those who are truly Christians cannot be forced to do any of these things. Now, we read in other writings of his that he did kill Christians if they didn't do these things, but it wasn't that he killed them because it was a crime to be a Christian. He killed them because it was a crime not to obey what he said. And so uh, this just kind of shows that that there was not any uh, empire or emperor-sanctioned widespread law that said it, it's, a, it's against the law to be a Christian. You must worship the Roman Empire. There's just not any evidence of that. There was some stuff that was kind of sporadic in small places, but not the widespread stuff that the traditional understanding of Revelation has. So uh, any questions or thoughts or comments on any of that? Yes. Uh huh. Early Christian. And one of the things that I read in there said that during Nero's reign, he was persecuting the actual people instead of siding with him. Actually, sympathized. Right. Or well, just the opposite. Right. They sympathized with the people and thought, you know, that's it yeah. right. Right. Yeah. The the uh, a big part of the population. They, they got tired of, of seeing the persecution of the Christians, the, the horrible things that he did to them, and, and they rose up against him. And like I say, being the politician that he was, you know, uh, he gave in to, to what the people, or what he, what he felt that the people wanted. So, so his persecution, even though it was terrible, uh, it wasn't this widespread thing that... Yeah, it did. It ended up working against him instead of for him. So, thank you, Linda. Any any other questions, comments, thoughts on any of this? Okay. So, if that and now and and don't get me wrong, I'm not saying that there wasn't any persecution because uh, John, when he's writing the letter, even says, "Let me t- turn here and." and find it real quick. I forgot to look this up. But but John does... uh, Yeah, in in Revelation chapter 1, verse 9, he says, I, John, your brother and companion in the suffering and the kingdom and patient endurance that are ours in in Jesus. And so John admits that there has been suffering. We read as we go, as we'll get into the book of Revelation, it talks about those who were martyred. And so we know that, that those things have happened. We know that those things probably were happening. Uh just not necessarily that's probably not the only thing that John is writing to address let me just look through here real quick okay so 
so if we're going to say that it, it that Revelation wasn't written just because the Christians were, uh, you know, we have this view that if they stepped out their door, the people knew they were Christians and were going to kill them. And so we, we have this view that all of the Christians were in hiding. The beast is out to devour all of them. And so John writes this to, to make sure that, that they know that, yes, you're being persecuted. Yes, you might be killed. But in the end, there's going to be victory. So that's the way we've understood it a lot of... I have a question. Yes, ma'am. Wasn't there two kinds of suffering? One because of the economy when they went to war and all that went defeated or whatever. The Christians would suffer with everybody else and then because of their beliefs, because mm-hmm. they did not bow down. Yeah. There, there, were, there was suffering, absolutely. I mean... If, if the economy as a whole went bad, the Christians suffered through that as well, yes. But also, if, if let's say, you're going back, you know, if you had a store and it had been very prominent and then you become a Christian and, and you get rid of all of the idols, now nobody else in town shops at your store, that's persecution. Uh, if you go back and you read most of the letters written to the, to the churches, uh, in fact, turn over to First Peter real quick. Because I know we talked about this. Uh, Peter writes in chapter 1 to uh, Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to God's elect, strangers or exiles in the world scattered throughout Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia. Uh, So he writes to a people who are struggling and who have been dispersed who have been, and the reason they were dispersed uh, you remember when Stephen was stoned uh, in in the book of Acts and that there was this dispersion of people Christians fled because they were afraid that they were going to endure the same thing and that's a, a pretty common thing uh, that the Christians were were persecuted for various reasons and and, ha- and had to flee and had to disperse because uh, different things would come up, and uh, and so there there was that kind of persecution, and then there was also, uh, you know, and that was kind of an economic persecution, just a, a harassing kind of persecution, uh, a fear of death was another part of it because you know, from the beginning Christians have been killed for being Christians, and so there is that stuff that does take place. But that's not all that's going on in the book of Revelation. And so that was the kind of traditional view. But as as scholars have looked at it and seen that there wasn't that widespread persecution that we've always thought, uh, they began looking at what are some of the other things that are going on in that time period. What was the culture like in other ways? And so there's this new trend that views Revelation as a response to the seductive power of imperial Rome rather than to its persecuting activities. And I'm reading from from the book here. It says, Rather than a context in which John's churches face affliction, hardship, and opposition, this new interpretation proposes that John's churches were too comfortable within Roman society. They were seduced by Roman promises of peace and prosperity and so made accommodations to Roman imperial culture that, in John's estimation, led to compromising their faith. If the purpose of revelation in the traditional view is to comfort suffering churches with promises of victory, its purpose in this newer view is to call complacent churches to repentance by representing Rome as a beast in opposition to God. And as we get into the book, we're going to, you know, and and just turn over there real quick into Revelation. And let's just look uh, at at these first, at these letters written to these churches. Don't you think sometimes we sort of mix this up with with, uh, the Jews persecuting Christians probably as much or more 
during this time period than uh, the government was. Well, See, Stephen mm -hmm. was killed by his own right. kinsman. John would be, or James would be headed. Right. So they were put in prison. You know, they were persecuted pretty mm -hmm. much. Uh, you see. And I know there was a lot of that going on, Harley, but, but if Revelation is, in, in, and I'm just sharing with you thoughts off the top of my head right now, uh, which is a really scary thing, but if Revelation is written as late as a lot of people think it is, the destruction of Jerusalem has probably you know, already occurred. Uh, there may not be as much direct persecution from the Jews that, that's impacting this letter because we, we find out that the beast is Babylon or Rome and so it's everything in the letter seems to be directed more towards the Roman influence on the people more so than the, the Jewish persecution or the Jewish oppression uh, but we'll we'll dig into that a little bit more as we, we have more recordings of the persecution from within yeah, especially in right, especially in in all the earlier letters. You know, when Paul's writings deal with that a lot, but then Paul wrote you know a lot earlier than than this book, and and at that time, you know, the Christians and the Jews were still really tightly interwoven. I think by this time, by the time Revelation is written, it's pretty clear that the Christians weren't just goofy Jews, but they were something totally different. And so the, it seems like Constantine had to come along in three three hundred eleven, mm -hmm. you know, to straighten the, the government and the Christianity out. Right. Because of what the previous emperor did. Yeah, and and Constantine actually destroyed the church, which we can get into that one a whole other time because he just he basically made the church a pagan cult with a different title to it but that's another lesson for another time but but turn in with me to chapter 2 in Revelation and I just want to read through these we'll, we'll dig into them a little more as we actually get into the text but I just want you to, to be listening for uh, two major themes that come up here one would be persecution and the other one is going to we're going to call it assimilation By assimilation, I mean just kind of accepting whatever the Roman political government and stuff has done. Just being buddy buddy with the with the government system, so that your life is comfortable, easy, and you're happy. Because after all, God wants us to be happy, right? Okay. Anyway, uh, so we're, let's read this first letter. Think about both of these two themes, and then we'll go back, and you can tell me which parts of this letter you think point to either one of those things. To the, to the angel of the church in Ephesus write, These are the words of him who holds the seven stars in his right hand and walks among the seven golden lampstands. I know your deeds, your hard work, and your perseverance. I know that you cannot tolerate wicked men, that you have tested those who claim to be apostles but are not and have found them false. You have persevered and have endured hardships for my name, and have not grown weary. Yet I hold this against you. You have forsaken your first love. Remember the height from which you have fallen. Repent, and do these things you did at first. If you do not repent, I will come to you and remove your lampstand from its place. But you have this in your favor. You hate the practice of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. So, what part in that letter do you think uh, sounds like they were being persecuted? Perseverance. Perseverance, okay. And, and why do you say perseverance deals with persecution? So if they're being persecuted and threatened because of their faith, if they endure, that's perseverance. Okay, And I agree with you on that. But could perseverance also be you guys haven't just given in to the powers of the government. You stayed firm in your faith. Okay, 
so, and I'm not saying that it's definitely one way or another, but but I think that that could go in either one of those categories. Anything else that that points to persecution? Okay, which says you have persevered and have endured hardships for my name and not grown weary. I, I think I think in some ways, to me, that sounds more like this. They've endured some some kind of hardship which sounds like they were being persecuted. Okay? Okay? Which says, I know your deeds, your hard work, and your perseverance. I know that you cannot tolerate wicked men, that you have tested those who claim to be apostles but are not, and have found them false. Okay? <laughs> what passages in there seem to indicate that there was some assimilation taking place. Four and five. five. Yet I hold this against you. You have forsaken your first love. Remember the height from which you have fallen. Repent and do the things you did at first. Uh, Sounds like maybe they wavered a little bit on something. Uh, Let's read through the one to Smyrna real quick and, and then... I want to kind of wrap some of this section up. To the church, to the angel of the church in Smyrna write, These are the words of him who is the first and the last, who died and came to life. I know your afflictions and your poverty, yet you are rich. I know the slander of those who say they are Jews and are not, but are a synagogue of Satan. Do not be afraid of what you are about to suffer. I tell you, the devil will put some of you in prison to test you, and you will suffer persecution for ten days. Be faithful even to the point of death, and I will give you a crown of life. He who has an ear to hear, let him hear what the Spirit says. Anything in that letter that suggests persecution? Yeah, pretty much the whole thing. <laughs> you guys are about to endure some bad stuff. Satan's going to put you into prison, test you. Uh, that, that letter sounds pretty much like persecution to me. Uh, I'll look through here real quick. Uh, look down in verse 18 to the church at Thyatira. To the angel of the church in Thyatira write, These are the words of the Son of God whose eyes are like blazing fire and whose feet are like burnished bronze. I know your deeds, your love and your and faith, your service and perseverance, that you are now doing more than you did at first. Nevertheless, I have this against you. You tolerate that woman Jezebel, who calls herself a prophetess. By her teaching, she misleads my servants into sexual immorality and eating of food sacrificed to idols. I have given her time to repent of her immorality, but she is unwilling. So I will cast her on a bed of suffering, and I will make those who commit adultery with her suffer intensely unless they repent of her ways. I'll just stop right there. Which does that sound more like, that the church in Thyatira was being persecuted or that they were assimilating? Assimilating, absolutely. And so, so there are these kind of themes that are going on. Now, I said from the outset, and I'm going to kind of wrap up with this this morning, that if we understand Revelation from this perspective, the book of Revelation becomes a very important book in our day. Now, one of the reasons that for a lot of people we've kind of dismissed it is if it's only about being persecuted and only about the fear of of our physical life, when was the last time any of you were arrested and beaten because you were a Christian? When was the last time anyone in our country was arrested and beaten for being a Christian? And so for us, it doesn't have that much meaning from that, from this perspective. But now let me ask you, how much do you think the church is guilty of assimilating with our government? Yeah. Uh, I, was talk- I was having a conversation with someone the other day, and and we were talking about how the beast has wormed his way into so much of the life of the church. 
And I know you guys are going to get mad at me for saying this stuff, but, but it's true, okay? When Social Security was first started in our country, there were many, many, many Christians who rebelled against that because the government is not going to take care of me and my family. We trust in God. And we are not going to rely on the government and the powers of the government to take care of us. We are not getting into bed with that beast. How many of you today would reject your Social Security checks because of your faith? Nope. Medicare and Medicaid, same thing. When it first started, Christians, many Christians said, uh-uh, no, because that's just pulling us in to get us in bed with the beast. How many of you are going to reject, reject your Medicare and Medicaid? How Oh yeah, that oh isn't that isn't that really slick? We're gonna take your money and we'll give it back to you later. Yeah. 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 Mm-hmm. <laughs> you think that the beast might be a little tricky like that? So you don't really have a choice to kind of get in bed with him? Uh I remember you remember a few years ago when they switched and made everything digital TV? And so everybody like me that had an antenna now had to get a converter box? Yeah. But the government's so nice, they're going to give us a $50 voucher to go down and get our converter box. Didn't think anything about it. Filled out my forms, mailed them in, got my converter boxes. And then I was talking to a friend of mine, and he said, I won't take anything from the government. He said, the government is not my savior. I felt guilty taking my $50 coupon for my... But that's the way it is. We don't think about it. This has just become our way of life these days. Uh, I heard a, a prayer, and I'm going to get it. I'm going to get it transcribed because you can't hear it very well. But I think it's a perfect illustration of how our how we the church has assimilated so that we fit right in with the political world today. It was a, a prayer at a political gathering where they were celebrating the continuing freedom of choice for women as far as women's uh, right to have abortions. And it was a five minute long prayer given by a woman thanking God for allowing women to continue to have that choice. Thanking God for providing such excellent doctors to perform abortions, thanking God for the thousands of successful abortions that have been performed in the past year, thanking God for the facilities that provide those free abortions. Now, does that bother any of you? But, see, we have gotten to the point where we want God to fit with our political agenda. And, and yeah, I'm an equal opportunity offender here today because the Republicans are guilty of it, of saying if God was here, he'd be a Republican. Absolutely. And Democrats are guilty of it by saying if God was here, he'd be a Democrat. And we have taken God and shoved him into our political boxes. We have, as a church, assimilated with the beast in many ways. And so the book of Revelation, if it's written to warn the church about this, I'm going to tell you in 2013, United States of America, this book becomes very, very important. I I said something at the prayer breakfast yesterday that I had heard up in Wisconsin. One of the guys was talking about a, a letter written or a book written by Dietrich Bonhoeffer. Any of you know who Dietrich Bonhoeffer is? If you've, if you've never read any of his stuff, I would strongly advise you to read some of his stuff. He was probably one of the greatest theologians of our time. He was uh, with the church in Germany during the time of Hitler's reign. Bonhoeffer saw what was happening. He saw what the government particularly Hitler, was trying to do in the way they were trying to assimilate the church into what he wanted to do. And Bonhoeffer wrote and he said, if we, don't, if we as a church don't stand up and do something different very soon, it's going to be too late. The problem was it was already too late. 
Bonhoeffer was eventually arrested and, uh, and suffered dearly for the things that he wrote. But the speaker that mentioned this up there, he said that same letter written by Bonhoeffer would be very applicable to America today. And in the fact that if we as Christians, if the church does not start standing up and doing something, it may be too late. Because th there are things that we just tolerated from our government so long that they're just being now foisted upon the church and, and, and we're silent. And eventually the church will cease to exist here as it did in Germany because the government will, will just shut it down. So you were going to say something, Teresa? Well, I mean, I'm not saying I promote gun control or not, but it's, there's a lot of paradoxes because a lot of people say, oh, we don't want guns mm -hmm. so to kill our children mm -hmm. or to protect our children in school mm -hmm. with gun control, but then we'll turn around and have abortion. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's just um, there's so many. Yeah, um, yeah, but you know. yeah, and you're very right. But but I, I just want us to be thinking about this whole assimilation thing. And as we get into Revelation, I think we're going to see that the book speaks very loudly to us today, and, and probably more bluntly than a lot of the other New Testament books that we we tend to to like to read uh, a whole lot better because. I think we're going to find out this picture that that always we struggle with, the picture of the beast and the dragon and all that kind of stuff. We understand it from this perspective. I think we're going to find out that's a whole lot scarier than we even thought it was for us. So that's kind of where we're going to stop today. Uh, any final thoughts, questions, comments? Yes, ma'am. Hasn't the Catholic Church sued some local and state government for trying to overturn some of the laws they passed, like about abortion and um, like the health insurance, but they don't always win? I, I do not know. I don't know about that. I have to be real honest. I can see the Catholic Church doing that because the Catholic Church, and this is again one of those, those ironic things, the Catholic Church has been one of the leaders in standing against the government. Uh, especially coming out of the Vatican, saying, no, we will not be forced to give birth control you know, to, to our employees and things like that because of their religious, religious convictions. The, the problem with what's going on in the Catholic Church is they push for that, and yet this whole deal with uh, the priest and the child abuse and stuff that's gone on, we're finding out is more and more and more widespread than we ever, ever, ever thought. And so the Catholic Church was even guilty of just tolerating some things to kind of keep things going, which is that assimilation thing. And, and they're standing up for some things, but you know, once, once we quit being disciples and just start kind of fitting in with the rest of the world, then we don't have a leg to stand on. You know, because we can't say we are a holy people called to, to be God's presence here and therefore we can't stand for this stuff when they're saying, yeah, but <laughs> we know what you're doing behind closed doors. And so that's why, you know, this call to be the people of God is, is so important uh, for us today because without that, we will not have the impact on the world that we're supposed to have. Well, hey. this is blindsided, though. It's like, okay, we look back and we see what it did, but when we're living through it, exactly. we're in total ignorance and we don't know nothing. And, and that is so true. So up there with persecution should also be the word opposition. Okay. And, um, um, and then also we're called to be into the world, not to go off and be by ourselves. Yep. Mm -hmm. So that throws us in that all over again. It, it's like, where are the lines? If we're not going to assimilate, we're going to be persecuted. Absolutely. And those two do go hand in hand. And you brought up a really good point. Another friend of mine told me about a, a book he just read, and I've got to find out the title and read it. But it talks about the ways that that beast has, has managed to slowly, slowly move us to where we are. And he said, for instance, like, you know, uh, somebody shows up at your house and says, you know, your property taxes have gone up. And you said, well, I don't know why, you know, nothing's increased. Well, that's just the way it is. 
and slowly but surely, we, you know, we just get to you go to the bank. They charged you a fee for something. You go and you say, "Why did you charge me this fee?" Well, that's just the way it is now. We charge that fee, <laughs> and and we just kind of, you know, before and it's just slow little things. Like like I mentioned, you know, about the Social Security stuff. And I'm not telling you guys to to go out and reject your Social Security because we've we've learned to just make that who we are. Okay. But, you know, also, you got to realize that. God is Lord of light and Lord of darkness. He's allowing us to have to chill. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. So he's Lord of darkness. Yeah. Uh, James mm -hmm. talks about that, the, the trials that we go through mm -hmm. that build the perseverance and stuff so that when we decide we're not going to assimilate, we have the perseverance that we can deal with the persecution. Uh, but, but, yeah, it's a... It's, when we wake up and realize how much we have moved from being true disciples standing up and just think about all the things we just kind of accept, uh, boy, it's, it's scary. And I'm talking about for me. I'm not, I'm not saying about for you guys. I'm not about to, about to step out there. But we're actually going to talk about some of this in our sermon in just a little bit. Linda, your comment. Hang on just a just second. Only the first bell has rang. Hey, hang on. Hey, guys. Hey, 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 hey. If you guys could be still just a second. Linda's trying to say something real quick. This lady's granddaughter, she was in the class a little girl, seven, eight years old. That little girl, she sneezes, and she said, God bless you. Teacher runs over and said, honey, you can't say that here. So her grandmother told her, she said, the next time you look at that teacher and say, God bless you, God bless you, God bless you. <laughs>